皆さんこんばんは。こんにちは。おはようございます。キニマンス塚本ニキです。毎週火曜日、こちらポリタス TV でお届けしているニキタス。今週はとってもスペシャルな企画でお届けしますが、その前にですね、えー、今日の放送はいつものように来週火曜日の午後7時まで無料でご覧いただけます。それ以降は、ポリタス TV の YouTube メンバーシップにぜひご登録ください。えー、いつでも好きな時に過去の番組が見放題になります。また、こちら2つの上位プランもご用意しておりまして、こちらにアップグレードいただくと、上位プラン向けの特別限定動画なども見られますので、えー、ぜひぜひご登録、アップグレードいただき、ポリタス TV 今後も継続できるためにご協力よろしくお願いいたします。So, let's get started! Hi!、Um, we have Have many special guests today, and why am I speaking in English? You might ask. Well, because today we are going to be speaking almost entirely in English. And yes, we have subtitles. 字幕機能ございます。はい。皆さんね、ここからはなんとほぼ全編英語でお届けするという、なんともチャレンジングな企画なんですが、YouTube でご覧の方はね、もうあの、ご存知と思いますけれど、字幕機能がございますので、画面のね、えー、ここら辺かな、なんか CC っていうね、あの、アイコン、ボタンがあるんですけれど、そこをクリックしていただくと、えー、まあ、日本語っていうやつがね、出てくると思いますので、えー、ちゃんと皆さんにえー、お分かりやすくお届けできるように、そちらの方も設定しておきます。はい。まずは今日一緒に、えー、MC を務めてくださるこの方をご紹介しましょう。はい。ノイズのジャパンフィフティーズプロジェクト代表の野口桃子です。よろしくお願いします。How are you, 桃子 ?Yes, I'm fine, but it's too hot. It's too hot. <笑> yeah. Yes. あの、そう、え、今日は、え、私はとりあえずここまで日本語でやっていいですか<笑>お願いします。<笑>今日はですね、あの、たまたま私の、あの、友達が、デンマーク、ニュージーランド、台湾から3人、あの、来て、日本に来ていて。なんと。なんと。で、全員集まるなら、なんか、なんていうでしょう、この若者の政治参加とか、若い世代の民主主義についてみたいなところで、あの、グローバルサミットみたいにできるねっていうのを、この間、リキさんと話して、まあ、この企画になっています。そう。なので、いきなり英語でグローバルユースサミットをお届けしたいと思います。はい。はい、一応ね、あのー、せん、あのー、字幕の設定をオンにした状態で、えー、ぜひご覧。いただければと思いますが。So, let's get started! Okay, I have to get used to speaking English now.、Uh, we have three very special guests from all around the world joining us today.、Uh, first, from Denmark, we have Frederick Dada. Hey. Hello, Frederick. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. You too. Yes, we'll get, we'll get to you soon.、Yes. And then next to him, we have Sophie Hanford from New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. And finally, we have Alvin Chung from Taiwan. Hi, I'm Alvin from Taiwan. Yoroshiko n e g a i s h i m a s So today, what we wanted to do is ask each of you,、um, you, What kind of political activities you're involved in? Because、uh, we will soon find out you are all very involved, very active in your country, in your region. And you are all in your 20s, correct?、Mm. So, as、uh, Gen Zs who are very <laughs> active,、uh, we are very interested to know what kind of roles you play and what kind of issues、mm. there are in, in your countries. So,、um, we're going to be talking a lot today, so I think we should get right into it.、Mm. Um, should we first get. Sophie. Sophie. Ah, okay. <laughs> Representing <laughs> New Zealand. Yeah.、Um, you've actually been on TV in Japan recently. Yeah, I was on TVS News talking with Naomi, who's an amazing. I think we're both model and also political activist in her own right. So, yeah, had the chance to. Talk with her about young people and politics.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And you've been in Japan how long now? Seven weeks and I leave in five days.、Oh、It's gone、God. by so、That's、fast.、Awesome. Yeah, yeah, but I've had the most amazing time and, and met the most amazing friends and yeah, feel very much a part of a community of young people trying to make a difference here. So it's been very inspiring. Yeah.、Wow. So please tell us、um, your story. How did you、okay. get to be where you are now? Yeah, sure. I will just start a timer because I know that I'll, like, <laughs> we were just talking about this before. Sometimes we can, we can go, we can really、um, talk if we are given free reign. So, kia ora. Hello, my name is Sophie. I am. 
uh, I kind of coined myself, I guess, both an activist and also a politician, but my activism is very much what has drove me to get involved with politics. Um, in 2019, I helped to start and coordinate the school strike for climate movement in New Zealand, very much off the back of what was um, a movement which was taking the globe by storm and seeing young people step into their power um, and find their people to then make a difference in the world. And so, yeah, I felt really yeah. inspired uh, by that movement and wanted to start a New Zealand chapter. Um, you have the pictures. Ah, yeah. Wow. So, so this picture uh, depicts the New Zealand. It depicts one of the largest ever single day strikes in New Zealand's history. And we managed to mobilise 3.5% of New Zealand's population, 170,000 people, predominantly young. Um, but we also got 290 businesses to close their doors on the day of the strike to walk out in solidarity with young people standing united for climate justice. So now, this, this is the beehive. This right? is the beehive, correct. So this is where our central government like nationwide government decisions are made and uh, the Prime Minister sits up there on the ninth floor of the beehive wow. and so we yeah we very much took it upon ourselves to make sure that it wasn't just those who had the chance to vote who were getting involved in politics but we figured that if we showed up on the doorsteps of their house of their um, where they make these decisions and the place that um, holds so much sort of power over day-to-day -day life of people in New Zealand, um, but also has a lot of levers that, that they can pull to make the changes which will ensure we inherit a livable future. Um, our goal was really just to say, you can't ignore us anymore, and if you continue to ignore us, well, shame on you, we'll keep being louder, we'll keep bringing more people, and we'll keep finding ways to make our message heard. So that was the, yeah, the kind of symbolism, I guess, of that image. And the next image uh, is, yeah, one which is, I guess indicative of how loud the movement is in New Zealand at the moment. Uh, the climate justice movement grew from, or well, the school strike movement grew from being just four of us to having now an organising team of over 60 across New Zealand, very committed, passionate young people. And there are so many different branches of the climate movement, which again, only continue to strengthen. Uh, there's a group of lawyers for climate action. A lot of them are young. They help to draft the zero carbon bill, which is now a piece of legislation. Uh, it's a cornerstone to New Zealand's climate response. And the young people that drafted that are very much involved and connected with the School Strike for Climate movement too. Um, so it's not just sort of a, a mode of, of activism, but also using the law um, to understand how we can how we can see that as a tool to um, yeah to get us where we need to go as well. Mm. And so that then led me to running for council uh, in the same year. I was feeling like the momentum and the this kind of big wave of change that we'd been a part of creating at the grassroots was so inspiring and it, it had given me so much hope connecting with these young people who who were just so energised about the future. They were both fearful, for sure, because thinking about the climate crisis can be overwhelming, it can be terrifying, the scale, the urgency, but these young people wanted to translate that into action and, mm. and use it as fuel to continue loving the planet and continue being excited about what's possible. So I ran for council and my team was entirely young, none of whom, none of my team actually could vote for me. They were either too young or didn't live in the ward that I was standing to represent. And, and can you tell us how old you were when you first yes. ran for council? So I was 18 years You're of 18 age. 18 years old. Just graduated high school and spent my first year out of high school yeah, mobilizing people for climate justice because we know that this moment in time is crucial if we want to um, make sure that this planet is livable and our climate is safe for the generations that follow. And yeah, then I decided to run for council at 18. Never really thought that I would actually be elected. It was more of a, again, a protest, <laughs> knowing that we have, to, um, we have to stand up to our leaders, especially if they're not leading and confronting the issues that we face with the kind of um, bold and courageous leadership that's required. So I said, okay, well, we'll get in there and do it ourselves. If not us, then who? So ran for council and, as I mentioned, was elected. I was up against two middle-aged men, one of whom owned a bunch of businesses in the ward I was standing to, to be elected in. So, yeah, didn't really think I stood much of a chance, but we did it. And I think mainly because of, again, it comes back to grassroots mobilisation. We just had people out door knocking every single weekend. We were handing out pamphlets at markets. We were holding Facebook lives. We were uh, holding 
fundraising events, we were holding community meetings, every single avenue we we tried and we put a lot of energy and time into. So yeah, I very much credit that back to the young people who organised the campaign. Uh, and now I sit on the Kapiti Coast District Council as the youngest elected member in New Zealand's history, being elected at 18, and also wow. the youngest around the table by 30 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's so you best. and somebody in their late 40s. Yeah, actually in their 50s. Yeah, 50s. yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's there. there is quite a generational gap and that presents some challenges, both in terms of how I perceive my right to be at the table. I think mm. sometimes it comes with a sense of imposter syndrome, but I know yeah. that if I embody confidence, then other young people will see someone who looks like them and who reflects them at the table owning that space. And I think that's really what um, what we need to, them to see. And also for those of us who are in these political spaces, putting down the ladder so that we can bring as many people through the door as possible. Um, I've also, just this triennium, I've been re-elected in 2022. And I now chair the Strategy Operations and Finance Committee, which is a committee of the whole council and it's the uh, most delegated to committee. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of responsibility and I've had to learn so much on the go and I felt out of my depth a lot of the time, um, but I'm grateful to have had some amazing supports around me. Mm. Um, and I'm only one young person in, in politics in New Zealand. I'm very much only one voice and I don't claim to represent that of all, of all youth, nor, um, nor I'm sure do any of us. But I think what's been really inspiring in the context of New Zealand is when I was elected, there were two others who were um, 18 and 19 years of age also elected. We saw what was called a youth quake, mm. where now and since then, since 2019, we've seen like, I think over like 25 people under the age of of 30 be elected to their local government. And now our young elected members network in New Zealand has grown to over 140 people. Mm -hmm. So that's all elected members to local government under the age of 40 years old. So we're growing and we're, we're starting to really collectivize our approach, which is meaning that we have a lot of power over the local government landscape in New Zealand as young people, which again, is I think, a really important step both locally but also for us to put pressure on central government mm. um, specifically for climate action is something I'm really passionate about but also um, youth empowerment and social justice too because our new government that we have is um, putting a lot of that at risk which is something that concerns me. Um, another photo that I have as well is of Hannah Rafati Maipi Clark. Uh, she, yeah, she just became the youngest ever member of parliament elected in New Zealand's history. Mm. She's 21 years of age. Mm. She's a fierce indigenous woman. She, as her first speech in the House of Representatives, she did a haka, which is mm. a traditional yeah. Maori wero, a Maori challenge. And she is someone who I think really represents and encompasses exactly what politics needs. Politics needs people to challenge it. Not only the people in it, the people in politics, but the systems of politics that we seem to just trust by virtue of the fact that they've always been there. But she is someone who I really respect and admire for challenging, challenging them. And um, there's a bunch of other amazing indigenous women as well. And probably just to wrap up with one last point, um, another photo that I'd love to, to share is of the Make It 16 campaign in New Zealand. Another really important and topical uh, issue but also decision that's been made by the Supreme Court to declare the current voting age in New Zealand of 18 being inconsistent with the Bill of Rights Act. I think you've got a, you have a uh, photo picture. Yeah, yeah, yep, there should be a oh, picture somewhere. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Ah. So this is the amazing team from Make It 16 outside the Supreme Court just after it was declared um, inconsistent with the Bill of Rights Act that the voting age was 18 because it's an unjustified breach of um, their right to be free from discrimination because just because they're 18, uh, because they're 16, sorry, they're discriminated against um, because they don't meet this quite rudimental age of 18 to be able to vote. And so what we're seeing in New Zealand is, and hopefully I've been able to somewhat articulate this, is youth movements in so many different corners. We've got the courts making rulings, the Supreme Court rulings, 
we've got young people running for politics and we're seeing that in larger numbers than ever. And then we've also got a, a, an ever increasing, strong, powerful, articulate group of young people who are mobilising on the streets. So what we're seeing in New Zealand is kind of like a triangular force, which is making politicians sit up and listen. And so I think if you can find where your passion lies and what kind of angle you want to come at these issues with, whatever you might feel passionately about, um, every voice is needed, whether it's through politics, through the law, through activism and through being out on the streets. Um, all of those voices count. And in New Zealand, yeah, we've seen policy change because of it. So um, I'm looking forward to sort of learning about how in each of your contexts um, those movements have continued to to gain momentum as well, because I think when we look at the state of our world, we can't afford to lose hope and we also um, can't afford to slow down and we we really can't afford to lose momentum and traction on, on these issues. And as young people, I think we have to be at the forefront of that. So yeah, that's a bit about my background, I guess, and what led me to where I am now and, and why I do what I do uh, is really for future generations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sophie. That was so amazing. I mean, I've got so many questions already, but I'm, we'll, we'll have time for questions later, um, Hope. Um, so then next, I'd like to go to Alvin um, to tell us about yourself. How long have you been involved in politics in Taiwan? And what has been your, your journey like? What kind of challenges have you faced or are you facing right now? And um, I hear that you uh, you, we actually, I, I actually didn't know that um, you were coming here because uh, Momoko told me you you arrived in Japan uh, last week. Um, no, yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. you arrived. My yes. second day yes. in Tokyo. Yeah. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, take it away. Um, in fact, yeah, I'm so happy to be here mm. in Tokyo, and I'm from Taiwan. Uh, we are Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy. That's one organization uh, built up in 2018. Mm -hmm. So for now, it's about uh, six years now. And I am like in my 20s, but like almost to 30s. But for like public like, uh, participant in Taiwan, we are still quite young in Taiwan because in the past, I think in Taiwan, we don't give like young people many like not citizenship education or mm -hmm. like human rights discussion. So things happen from 2014, that's 10 years ago in Taiwan, we have a very, very big movement that's so-called Sunflower Movement. And at that time, because the government, they didn't really listen to the people. And at the time they tried to have the different agreement with the, like with China and with different countries talking about that. So at the time, the people just launched one demonstration by the parliament and in the end they rushed into the parliament mostly young people and they occupy the parliament that's a very very big turning point i think in time history and at the time i was just one uh, high school student just like sophie when you are uh, trying to participate in this kind of activity at the time we uh, take to the street and we try to do more although we were just uh, people from high schools, but at the time we try to gather the different student associations together and we try to uh, make people more focusing on this different issue. And after that, we, uh, I, I went to our, uh, my, uh, university that's called Taiwan University. That's kind of the, like many different people. We focus on different issues. We go to this university to, uh, to learn and to have different idea exchanged. So at the time we were being deeply participated into different movement. At the time we have the same sex marriage movement and we talk about climate change starting from then. And we talk about the different many issues, uh, discussed in our society. But I think at the time we didn't have the angle of generation justice. So we have the like same sex marriage referendum in 2018. At the time, like many of the like old generations, they don't want this kind of uh, issue to be like even discussed in our society because we are still tri tra traditional. But for many of the young people, because we being uh, under the uh, gender edu 
uh, gender equality education. So for us, that's like quite novel, normal, and we think we have to like respect all the others. So at the time, we took to the street, and we have many of the advocacy just on the street. And that's my uh, university time. We've been in the LGBT community. We've been to the uh, student association. And later on, we were like we went for the campaign of the uh, university student education uh, student association. After that, we were elected. So we were the uh, uh, NTU National uh, Taiwan University Student Association at the time. After that, after our term. We try to build up one organization in the whole civil society. So that's, uh, mostly my, uh, my high school and university time. And after that, we established our association in 2018. And we try to focus more on youth rights because when we talk about all of the different issues, we didn't have the, although we have many of our opinions, we talk a lot and we discuss a lot, but in the end, we cannot participate in like the uh, policy decision making process. So we try to build up our organization. We are from like many different backgrounds. Some of us are from like student association, but some of us are from different labor unions or different like social media before. But all of us, we have the common uh, thing is that we are youth and we want to change the society. So. Now, I understand uh, that the Taiwanese voting age is still at 20, yeah? Yeah. And you tried, you had tried to have it changed to 18, but it yeah, was denied. Yeah, but, but we kind of failed, but we are still like moving mm -hmm. on, on, on that. So the first thing is that I have the slide is that, uh, we, we tried to do the youth policy white paper, which is for Taiwanese, we have to, the first thing is that we have to go back to the hometown for voting. So if I'm like born in the southern part of Taiwan, I still have to like find the capital to go back to the, the, the place. We don't have like the remote, uh, voting process of that. So for young people, most of them, they don't really go to vote. And for the candidate, they don't have to launch any kind of youth policy because you don't vote. So I don't care about you, but we want to change this best. A circle for that. So we want to, we, we launch this white paper and we send that to all of the different candidates in our presidential election from 2020 and this time because we have like four years for each election. So after that, we invited the president, uh, candidate to come to our forum to really answer for the white paper and we promise for some of the issues that young people really care about. So this is when a uh, picture that he is now our president now because he got elected mm -hmm. and he promised many of the different issues that for the first thing is that uh, we ask for the mental health because mm -hmm. for teenagers, we are getting more and more serious problem on mental health. So now our gov government, they had the three times free consolation for young people and for high school student, we can have like each year six day for mental health day mm -hmm. if they just want to take a rest. Mm -hmm. And like for different issues, we don't want to make it for uh, the youth uh, youth rights or youth angle on these different issues. So we say every policy should be a youth policy mm -hmm. because we want to make people to be more participated, especially for young people. So the government uh, gradually now they've built up the a youth council in the local level and even at the central level we have the youth council and even because we focus more on children and youth so now for the central government they have their uh, children council they will ask for the opinion from the children that's under uh, 18 years old so they will be like, kind of elected to be the children counselor. How and they are young are these children? Under 18 years old. Okay, so the some youngest? of them are from uh, elementary school. Oh. So they'll like go to the central government to have the different proposal and they'll work together to discuss. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the member of the uh, youth council. <coughs> so we will also discuss together. But in Taiwan, our like definition of youth is from 18 to about 40. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yes, we still discuss together. And now our like, uh, youngest youngest legislator in the parliament is uh, still like 31 year, years old mm -hmm. and latest uh, the, the previous is uh 28. Mm -hmm. that's because the next thing i'm going to mention is that for young people 
we don't really go to vote in Taiwan because we cause a lot on voting. So we launched a campaign that is called a Take It Back Home for voting because we do the online fundraising to send the people back to their hometown for voting, oh. especially young people. So we want the young people to vote more and to affect the politics. And at the end, eventually, we want to change the candidate's thought that you have to care more about the young people because we vote, we are going to change. And for this, um, this campaign, we launched about like 2,000 people going back by our shuttle bus to their hometown to vote. Wow. Yeah. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is the referendum that we try to lower our voting age. Mm -hmm. Because I think the root of all these problems is that we still have a very, very high voting age in Taiwan. That's mm -hmm. 20. Mm -hmm. So for people like under 20, you're not going to take uh, care about politics mm -hmm. because you cannot vote, you cannot change. So even if we have this kind of um, youth counselor or like children counselor, but you still have to vote. That's the v very basic right. So we try to uh, launch the constitutional amendment referendum because our voting age is regulated in our constitution. So we try to change that. And that's very high. We have to get uh, help of the citizen to vote yes. And that's like a very, very high level. But that's the very beginning that we started from uh, 2020. And the legislator, all of them, they vote yes on this bill. And after that, because of our process of uh, the amendment, we still have to appeal to the referendum. So we go to the different cities and counties in Taiwan and even the outlying island. I can mention that uh, we have a very, like very far outline and that's very, very near China. And it's just like you can, on that island, you can see men in China. Mm -hmm. And we have also been there and just work with the uh, volunteer and young people there. And most of them are like very, very young, even children. Mm -hmm. So we work together and go to the speak, uh, street speech and talk with the parents or grandparents of them to talk, to persuade them to like vote for yes for the young people. But at the end, like we get the yes votes, no uh, more than the no votes. Mm -hmm. So, but we didn't get to the level, like a very high level for the yes votes. Mm. So we didn't repass really that. So now we still, um, if you want to vote, you still have to be 20 years old. And if you want to run for the campaign, you have to be 23, over 23. So that's about like very high. So Sophie's story is very inspiring for me. And we go to many different cities. And at the time, like for many young people, they are kind of uh, involved in this campaign and they know, wow, politics is really changing my life because if I don't really care about that, they are going to like vote for me. Mm. So I'm going to do that and do uh, care about the constitutional amendment. And later things that um, we try to do more for the uh, international society because we are from Taiwan. And in, in, in the past, like we are not that focused by the international society. But for many of the different issues, like we passed the census marriage in 2019, and that's the first in Asia. And we try to do the transitional justice and we try to get the young people to be like more participate. And we want to share this kind of different experience. And also we want to get some of the experience from the international society, like just like lowering the voting age, mm -hmm. like how can like Japan do that and Korea do that and even Malaysia or, or different Southeast Asian country. So we want to learn more and we want to share more. So the first thing is that we try to support Hong Kong more. And for many of the Hong Kong needs, I think uh, aside from the UK, uh, Taiwan is the, 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 the place that most of the Hong Kong needs refugees coming to Taiwan. Mm. So we try to support more. And uh, in 2019, at the time we gathered the, I think the biggest uh, rally, like aside from Hong Kong in Asia, we have like, uh, 10,000 people by the parliament to shout to the parliament that we have to care more about the Hong Kong needs and about the Taiwanese like connection with the Hong Kongers and with the civil society like in the whole international uh, society. So after that, like uh, Hong Kongese now and even like uh, Thai people in Myanmar coming to Taiwan. And I think we share the very uh, concrete, this kind of network and try to like do more to get the young, young people to be more participate. So we learn from the different like European country 
and the Korea experience. And we want to do the youth law to be passed in the parliament now first, like just before the amendment. And we are trying on that. And I think we can, like, I, we have the opportunity in these four years in the term of the parliament. Yeah. So that's basically our work. And I'm so happy. This is my first time coming to Tokyo to share. And I've learned, like, many things from from japan because like japan has lower the voting age and many of the like different i think most of the countries in the like international society have done that so i'm so inspired by the different experience from you thank you can i advance yes this? so you use instagram a lot and yeah. you have three hundred thousand followers. Yeah, we so we we, we are, that's <laughs> we why did a I lot use on, them. on that. Yeah. And we we have like we tried to have a very strong connection with the like high school and university student. So we tried to empower them to mm -hmm. that and know you, you can do more. So we tried to and we care about their their rights. So like in the past for for our high school student, they don't have student associations at, in in the campus and they have to wear the uniform or else they are going to be punished. Mm -hmm. And we still have a very strict like regulation in all of the schools in Taiwan. But now we try to like get rid of that. So mm -hmm. we, we have a very like strong advocacy to the Ministry of Education. So now in the like Taiwanese uh, campus or of the high school and university, they have to like have their own student association mm -hmm. and they should be the member of the school's committee. They can discuss with the principals or with the teachers together, like whether we are going to wear uniform or not, or whether we are going to build up a new building for school or not, and how's the school, uh, the building going to be designed, like different style or different use. And uh, now, so for the high school student, they take like democracy for their like everyday life yeah. to be more participated. And so we use the Instagram to tell them that you can yeah. do that and you can be more particip participate. And after like that, you can be the citizen and a very like responsible cit citizen because you've been experienced this kind of um, democracy just like before you become the citizen. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. Okay, shall we go on to Frederick now? Now, Frederick and I, we actually met uh, very recently. Yeah. We um, went to uh, a school in Yokohama to do a, a speech. For you. Yeah. yeah, two speeches, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you've also just been to Kansai to do yes. some seminars there. Yeah. yeah, I've just been in Osaka and in the small town of Magasaki, which <laughs> it only has a million residents, meaning that for people here, it's a very small town, but still twice the size as the capital city of, of Denmark, Copenhagen, where I live. So, yeah, that's been very different for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the weather is very different as well from Copenhagen. Yeah, it is. I think that's probably the hardest thing getting used to being here is just the constant heat. And mm. like every night I, I just sit in the shower with the, with yeah. the coldest water I can get, <laughs> just sitting and trying to like cool down. But every time I take the shower away, I can just feel my body <laughs> still being much too hot. So uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're surviving <laughs> so far. Almost. <laughs> yeah. and, and how long are you in Japan this time? I'm in Japan for a month in total. So I've been here for, I think, 10 days now. So one third of my journey here is, is done, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I still have much to see and much to learn. Yeah. So, so tell us, uh, what brings you to Japan, but more importantly, you know, what kind of journey you have, um, led um, yeah. since your teenage years and what kind of, um, issues and political situation, um, is happening in Denmark right now? Yes. I will try my best. Actually, I, I'm mostly in my head right now. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm really impressed about your stories, but I will try to focus on my own for now. And um, so, yes, I'm from Denmark, a, a small country in the Nordics in Europe. And uh, my kind of political journey started when I was 13. Uh, it wasn't that anything really big happened, but uh, it was kind of my very own small steps into this world of, of politics and what happened was 
uh, quite simple. The bus routes in my town were being cut by the municipalities. And uh, that meant that for me and a lot of my classmates getting home from school, especially if we wanted to have friends or hobbies like or something like that, uh, that became much more difficult. And we had no idea what to do, but we wanted to do something. So we staged a, a very small protest of just, I think, five or six of my friends sitting down on the bus station and train station in Odense uh, and uh, with like uh, sleeping bags and then banners and signs saying that uh, if you cut any more bus routes, we'll have to just sleep here at the station. And it had no effect whatsoever on, on any kind of politics. But I think for us that did it, uh, it was a very big step uh, and felt actually kind of nice to feel in some way empowered, even though it, we didn't mm -hmm. succeed, but simply by just doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that stayed with me for a very long time and influenced the, my approach to, to changing things that it's, it often starts kind of close to you, just trying to, to change the things just around you. And that meant that when I later was in high school and I was 17 years old, uh, the government proposed some very big cuts to education. And it was all over the sector. It was from university down to elementary school. And the consequences would be very, very drastic. Uh, so just at my high school, if these cuts were passed by parliament, it would mean that every 10th teacher would be fired and a lot of other different small things would, uh, would become uh, very much worse. And especially for those students who, who didn't have like a uh, middle class or upper class backgrounds, so many uh, of the things that, that helped them through high school would, would be gone. And uh, we, in my student council discussed what to do in our high school. And when we heard that a lot of other high schools were thinking about occupying the buildings, uh, we wanted to be part of that. So we went out in every classroom and talked about the consequences of these budget cuts, met at a student assembly, all 800 students, uh, discussing whether to join these occupations or not. And in the end, there were only five who voted against and all the rest of us were in favor of occupying our school. So uh, we, uh, we, we rushed up to the teacher's office, locking them in uh, so they couldn't go out in the classrooms and check attendance. And that might sound very <laughs> yeah. aggressive, but actually it was very wholesome because the teachers were prepared for it. We had informed them about the possibility. So they had board games and cake and everything and preparing for just having a nice day off with their co co-workers while uh, we organized our own day of education. And we taught each other many things that they, from how to read the government budgets to how to do a speech at a demonstration. And then later on, we, we took all the banners we had in the moment we occupied the buildings, we had thrown a lot of banners out of the windows. And my high school is like placed just next to the station. So very central so that everybody passing could see this is an occupied building. <laughs> uh, we don't want those budget cuts. Mm. Uh, but then we took those banners, went to Copenhagen and joined what I still think is the biggest demonstration there's been in my lifetime uh, with tens of thousands of students and teachers and just ordinary citizens caring about education, uh, went to the streets. Uh, and, and that demonstration, I think, was just a very powerful moment for me because seeing not only classmates and friends, but so many people I had never met before standing together, we felt, I think, just so powerful. <laughs> Uh, in a way, and uh, and in the end, those budget cuts were dropped, uh, or at least a kind of compromise was made with very minimal uh, uh, cuts. And that, I think, was kind of the real beginning of, of my uh, way into activism. And I started doing a lot of student politics after that. We occupied our high school four times that year. <laughs> uh, in the end, our teachers got a little tired of us. But, but I think... Uh, in, in that time, there was a real sense of, of, yeah, the possibility to change things. And I think that meant that when the climate movement became really big in 2018 and in 19, just as in the rest of the world, I think that student movement kind of uh, transitioned into the climate movement. Now we weren't striking for, uh, for the education budgets. Now we were striking for climate. Uh, and a lot of really good things happened in those years. But uh, in the 2019 election uh, in June, there was a parliamentary election for the Danish parliament. 
uh, it was kind of a, a mixed bag because on one hand there was a mandate to form a new government that uh, became the most progressive uh, government there's been in in many many years and the most uh, kind of climate focused government but at the same time uh, the two you can say greenest parties actually had a very bad election night so we saw that these big movements in the streets with school strikes and protests and demonstration uh, through all of uh, the spring of 2019 it was as if it didn't really translate into uh, the rooms where they actually have to decide on our future and um, so in 2020 i was part of forming uh, red green youth an organization that is the youth wing of one of the political parties called the red green alliance and it was in order to kind of bridge the gap between what happens on the street and what happens in meeting rooms and fancy buildings uh, all over Denmark, uh, to make sure that that power, uh, yeah, is translated and 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 that young people's voices are heard, and uh, that's what I've spent the last four years doing, uh, building up Red Green Youth into a, a, a national movement of young people, and I've just taken a, a kind of simple photo from. Uh, one of the things we've been doing a lot this fall, uh, mm. a campaign for better public transit. Mm. And for me, it's been one of the funniest things to do simply because public transit uh, has had like no place in national media or debate through the last years, despite uh, the budget law, a very strict neoliberal uh, budget law that restricts how much money our municipalities can, can spend, mm. uh, forcing municipalities to cut on things like education and uh, child care, health care, and also public transit. Uh, mm -hmm. And in order to kind of get that debate onto the national stage, what we did was actually quite simple. We just uh, kind of broke into a lot of high schools and vocational schools in the lunch breaks with a lot of paper <laughs> uh, asking young people to share their opinion about the public transit crisis. And we already kind of knew what they would say, that the prices are going so much up that people are forced to to not uh, have hobbies and friends, that people need to take the car now because bus routes are being cut. And in general, just that people actually really want public transit, but it works so bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really proud of being part of a campaign that, that put uh, that issue, that young people's issue on, on the national stage. Uh, and it's, it, we haven't won yet, uh, but I think we've won the first part with, which is simply making sure that this issue is being discussed in, in national media. Uh, and now we have over a, a thousand, uh, like, we have thousands and thousands of letters from young people across Denmark uh, that we are not really sure what to do with. We've used some of them to, to put into the mailbox of the transport minister, but we don't know what to do with, <laughs> with all the others. So this is what I've spent a lot of time on, uh, discussing public transit and campaigning for free public transit in Denmark. Uh, another thing that's taking out a lot of uh, space in, in the last months is that uh, just one month ago we had European elections. So Denmark is part of the European Union, meaning that we also have uh, seats in the European Parliament. And uh, this was a source of hope for a lot of young people in Denmark with Kira Marie Peter Hansen, uh, the woman in the pink, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Jacket. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's actually the same in Danish. But <laughs> the pink jacket uh, becoming uh, the winner of the election with, uh, like, she was the one who got most votes of any candidate and she was up against some very big and powerful politicians. But uh, she, at only 26 years old, became the winner and star of the night, having been elected five years earlier at just 21 as the youngest member of the European Parliament wow. uh, ever. And uh, she and the rest of the progressive left did, did really well in these elections. And I think it's kind of a signal for uh, the next parliamentary elections that we're going to see, hopefully, mm -hmm. a big shift towards progressive forces again, because right now we have a government that I don't have a lot of good things to say about, both when it comes to climate and, and young people. Uh, and also mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, is uh, on our minds in Denmark, as they are uh, across the world, is what's happening in Gaza. Uh, we have in Denmark uh, a special responsibility, I think, because Denmark and Israel has 
uh, gotten closer and closer ties over the last years, both diplomatically, but also uh, with trade and, and economy. Uh, right now, uh, Danish companies are manufacturing the very weapon systems that Israel is using oh. as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Danish government has so far uh, not uh, in any way showed any willingness to, to kind of it changed that relationship instead mm -hmm. uh, giving Israel the green light to murder innocent Palestinians. So mm -hmm. uh, right now there's a very big youth mo movement uh, with the occupations, for example, of the biggest university in Denmark, Copenhagen University, that has uh, led to the uh, divestment of funds uh, in the uh, occupied West Bank. So a small victory and glimpse of hope in something that is uh, otherwise just very uh, mm -hmm. frightening. Uh, actually, the last thing I want to show you is just a, a photo from uh, one of the people's climate marches in, in Denmark. Uh, we have, after COVID, it's like the climate movement hasn't really found its momentum again, mm -hmm. unfortunately, giving uh, the current government a kind of a free pass to, to make policies for their friends in the big agricultural lobby. Uh, and Denmark, uh, is, is a small country, but most of our land is just farms, uh, meaning that we have very high emissions. And the only way to really get Danish emissions down is by making reforms uh, to our agriculture, to mm. our farms. Mm. And there, there are so many good things we can do with that, uh, not only for the climate, but also for making better jobs that pay more and uh, making a countryside that is less polluted and worth living in again. Um, and Right now, there's just been landed a compromise between the government and the big agricultural lobbyists. And there's been some few improvements on nature, but otherwise it's a, it's a very uh, a kind of disillusioning moment because we wait, waited for this reform in a long time. But uh, I think now what's needed is to take some of the inspiration I get here and go home and, and help that movement uh, regain its momentum so, uh, so we can finally get a reform of, of Danish agriculture. But yeah, that's some of the things that that are uh, kind of in my mind and the minds of a lot of young people in Denmark right now. So thank you so much for the invitation and for listening to this. Wow. So, yes. <laughs> so a lot of information, mm -hmm. a lot of inspirational stories, a lot of questions probably. Yes. Um, so I guess now I, th I think, I think all of us have, have something we want to mm. feedback mm. And, and share mm. and ask questions. So should we just, just whoever wants to, do, do you want to start? Do you, mm. I mean, no, yeah, but actually I talk a lot with each. So mm. oh, okay. yeah, I can, but, but I want to, I just want to say that I got many inspiration from them, like my lovely friends, mm -hmm. and so I'm so happy to share these like stories in like Japanese media. Like, yeah, just so I'm so yeah, happy to hear your stories and thank you for presentation. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, like gosh, I don't even know where to start. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's all of course you know every country is different mm -hmm. and every history yeah. every every region has its own culture and history and um but i think the the inspiration is definitely there like i mean uh sophie you mentioned the 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 climate protest or the, the climate strike that was in 2019 if i'm correct and you mentioned that 3.5 percent of the population um um they all they were mobilized in one way or another and that number sort of um sort of like had accord with me because of the 3.5 percent rule that um uh i think a sociologist or a social economist yeah. um mentioned um and and that something that kind of i keep to my heart is that the theory is that if you can mobilize 3.5 percent of a population then that is enough to create change like effective change um and it was funny that you mentioned that you know three point five percent of the population mm. get got together and um what was the atmosphere like during and after that big climate strike like from the not just from the youth but just the overall media and you know the the the, the 
status quo. Yeah, sure. The atmosphere was electric. Like, I think similarly to what Frederick mentioned, it just gave me so much hope. And I think we realised our collective power that when we consider kind of a business as usual, as usual who holds the power, we often look to those in power. Mm. But actually, if we have enough people who are passionate about what they're standing up for and um, have enough willpower and kind of collective aspiration to do something, there's actually not that much that we can't do. And I think what made it even more inspiring and, and brought more hope was that we only had a few thousand dollars. Like we weren't cashed up in any way. We had fundraised, we'd got a few grants, but really we had a couple of thousand dollars. We crowdfunded for traffic management. We borrowed vests and megaphones from other organisations. We were in no way mm. um, super knowledgeable about how to run a big protest. Mm. We were figuring it out as we went. But I think that also meant that the young people involved felt so, yeah, like felt like they were capable of so much. And mm. I think when you believe in, you believe in the possibility to, um, to fulfil something, or to you believe in your own capability and capacity. That's ultimately when you can go out into the world and, and create change and do, do things, um, which will hopefully have a flow-on effect. So yeah, I think both for the young people involved, but also the political kind of air in the, mm. in the air in the media was really shifted. Like I think the narrative towards young people, we also saw a shift in that. Um, so often in the media, I feel like young people can be portrayed as a bit of a nuisance. Like yeah. we're, it's always just talk about youth crime or it's talk about how um, young people are apathetic or, you know, they, they pick and choose the stories that suit the political mm. landscape at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But what we saw was that we had photos of young people with megaphones with their fists in the air and the media stopped being afraid of showing that side of young people, yeah. which I think, again, when you start to show young people both those stories about themselves reflected through social media and through mainstream media, that makes a massive difference on people's mm. perceptions mm. of young people. Mm. And I think that really helped us in the elections as well because mm. um, the local government elections that just followed that, people understood that young people weren't apathetic. Actually, young people care about so many issues and young people feel passionately about all of the intersections at which the planet and people are being hurt, but just so often don't feel like they have an avenue through which they can channel that. And so to see young people out there on the streets and then to know that there are avenues mm. such as politics where that can be channeled, I think brought a lot of hope to, yeah. um, to people and also yeah, those who might have had negative perceptions of mm. what young people thought or were capable of. What about mm. opinions that, you know, even if you see these young people organizing and protesting and, you know, voicing their demand for change, were there any opinions of, oh, they don't know what they're talking about because they're still young and naive mm. and immature? Oh, so many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People saying, and this happened a lot during the school strikes where we would have people saying, oh, it's you know, you're, you're never going to achieve anything. Why you, Why even bother? You know, like, why waste your time? Focus on your studies, um, learn some things, and then try and make a difference. But we don't have time. Like, we, we genuinely do not have time. When we look at, you know, it, it keeps on being said we've got 10 years to halve our emissions. We don't have 10 years. We're in 2024. We're almost in 2025 <laughs> now. Like, that 10-year thing is out the window. Um, when When... Yeah, innocent people are being murdered in front of our eyes and the media has gone numb to it. When young people around the world are feeling so disenfranchised by our political systems that they just don't, they, they think nothing of their ability to change anything. We've got something seriously wrong. We don't have time mm. to, to waste, not to say that education by any means is a waste, but in understanding that, um, yeah, that now has to be the moment in time that we take hold of our reality and change it to something different mm. I think that is is really really crucial mm. um, so yeah people said that we would never make a difference but we chose not to believe that mm. instead to believe something different which was that um, we could see the young people around us who had all different skill sets mm. like we gathered a very diverse team mm. of people from um, different parts of the country mm. with different backgrounds mm. different skill sets different um, yeah different perspectives on the world and I think that then really meant that we could could show that um, the way things have been doesn't have to be the way things continue to be. Um, and yeah, we could have that own narrative in our mind and then help to persuade people to believe it too. I got that a lot when I was running for council. What do you know? You're only 18. You have no life experience, no qualifications. But 
what's life experience done for us so far? It keeps digging us deeper and deeper and deeper. We need people who are more ambitious, who think differently, who aren't afraid of being of of you know their chances of re-election, who yeah. instead get into positions of power to make a difference because they care about issues. It's not about it's not about caring about being in a seat. Yeah. It's about caring about what you want to do with that seat that counts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think even in countries like New Zealand and probably also Denmark, you still maybe it's not as strong as like Asian countries, but there's this sort of notion that you know the older you are, the wiser and somehow more um, authoritative you know you're expected to be. And I, but I think in Taiwan, you know, where the voting age um, is still 20, as you said, and you know, maybe there's a stronger sense of you know you listen to your elders and you know children must be silent and do your studies. Mm. But yeah, there was really um, the, the thing. I I feel a lot of similarities are between Japan and Taiwan yeah. in terms of like the mm. culture and the the young people not having an opportunity to be interested in politics because our oh, politics are old people and it's boring. But but what Momoko, I want to ask your opinion about, you know, Alvin kept saying that, you know, the voting age has been lowered yeah. in, in Japan and Korea and elsewhere, but but the Japanese people didn't I don't think they really asked for it. Or the Japanese young people, there was yeah. no like demand. It just sort of mm. happened and the government decided to lower yeah. it and people were like, Oh, okay. <sighs> Yeah, of course we had small, not small, but we, we had the organizations and we had a campaign to lowering the age. But not, I think that, that is not only the reason why we had the lower it. Mm. It's mostly because LDP decided it because of their campaigns go, go well. Like, mm. Does it make sense? Mm. Like, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah, so. Mm, it's not for young people's right. It, it was because it was good for LDP, like the ruling party. Mm. So they just wanted more yeah, votes. Yeah, yeah, but mm -hmm. but I think that was a good change for us. Of course, the reason was not for us, but because after that we had many school policies, even though it's not enough. But we start to have education in schools mm, mm, yeah. about politics, not so much enough, but still we have now Shikensha yeah. Kyoiku students. Yeah. Yeah. Education. education. And also the mm, policies about tuitions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We, yeah, it's not enough, mm. but still we start. To I thought it was that. really interesting how you organized buses, shuttle buses for yeah, 2,000 yeah. people yeah, to cool. go back to mm. their hometowns. Mm. Because I, I have also met many mm. Japanese young people. I tell them you know, when it's election time, hey, make sure you vote. Mm. And they say, oh, I can't because I'm still registered in my hometown, which is ages away, so I'm not going to vote. Yeah. yeah, so, that's good. <laughs> it's so yeah, frustrating. That's a good campaign. That's the very beginning of mm. our organization, I think, because in 2018, at that time, that's still we are still in the bad circle, right? So for young people, when we talk about like uh, participating in politics, they'll say like how or like mm. what can we do mm. to make change? Mm. Yeah, maybe we want the change like happening, but like how? Yeah. So at the time, because I think that's a very weird but very inspiring opportunity that at the time in 2018 we have the local election. But every time when it comes to the local election for the young people, they like care less, even mm -hmm. like compared with the uh, central like president or parliamentary uh, election. So at the time, our government still have the 10 different referendums in one day. Wow. Mm. So you don't like you not only have to vote for the mayor or the city councillor, you also have to vote for like ten different referendums. <laughs> like I can like I can uh, introduce like some of them are for same sex uh, marriage at mm. the time and some of them are for uh, gender equality education mm -hmm. and some of them are for like uh, nuclear power or green energy. Wow. And like one very interesting mm. issue is that whether we are going to use the name of Taiwan or Chinese Taipei in the uh, Tokyo Olympics, oh. because that's like before the Tokyo Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. And so like so many different issues at the time. And for young people, we feel like 
exhausted yeah. to talk mm. with the society and to like persuade the like old generation that you have to vote for that mm. because that's our future. So we want same-sex marriage and we want like uh, cleaner energy mm. and we like we want to use our name like in the Olympics to in the civil society in the international society mm. and um, uh, eventually like even the the like uh, gender equality or like uh, LGBT rights, mm. all of them failed. Mm. So like seventy percent of the votes mm. vote for no mm. for like different progressive mm. issues. Mm. So at the time, I think for for people because we've been through the very big social movement mm. in twenty fourteen at that time, and after that we see no, we have to do more because not like after one big social movement our our so society is going to like move on we have to do more to like really pushing that so we try to have this uh take it back home campaign to that the young people we tell them you not only have to persuade your grandparents you have to vote yeah. <laughs> that's the only way that you make change from very basic yeah. basic level and after that, we try to launch that and we try to do the online fundraising. Mm -hmm. And like for many, um, not like old people, but for like people at my age, because we say, OK, we, ha we have to have like many workloads it during our daily life, but we still want to help. Mm -hmm. So we donate or we try to do more of the advocacy to that the people know that some people are doing that. And that's the very beginning that we have this idea to help to that the people that you can participate just through the online fundraising. And for young people, you can only like do just to go back to vote. So I think in 2020, the presidential election at that time, even uh, the people like uh, Taiwanese students starting in Tokyo, they have, I think, one plan to back, go back to Taiwan mm. for voting at mm. the time and they do their own fundraising and we do the like shuttle bus in Taiwan we try to talk with the like uh, tourist company <laughs> to tell you that yeah I know it's very hard but like we need 20 or 30 different shuttle bus in one city give us a good deal yes, yes. and like yeah you have to do that that's for democracy <laughs> wow. yeah and we we noticed that because we live in the capital it's Taipei and but we have we are one island country and we have many different islands like near Taiwan. So I just mentioned the Kimmen, that's a very outlying island. And we have Penghu, that's a very, very small island, but there are still many people living there. So for young people, of course, if you go like north and south, uh, it's quite it's it's very expensive, but compared with the outlying island, it's not that expensive. So we still have the shuttle boat to Boys. go there and wow. some of the flights mm. there and so that it become a very very big campaign at the yeah. time and we didn't like really foresee that we just we just wanted that people go back to vote but people try to donate more mm. and we try to yes do more for for the young people and i think we kind of see things changing because for some of the candidates they started to go to the like student association or go to the campus to like have the different discussion with them to mm. tell you that like what kind of issue you really care about. And we say, wow, that not really like happening before because like candidate they, they don't seem these people mm. going back for mm. voting. Mm. But they know like wow they are going back and we have to focus more. Mm. And after that, we try to let them promise that you have to support lowering the voting age. What so, about online voting? Like after all that trouble just to get people physically moving yeah. around to put a paper in a box. That's the main issue is that we are a, a, a country of like highly technology. <laughs> we have like even health, health percent of the, the, the like health of all the chips mm. from yeah, Taiwan. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, we are very afraid of the hacking from China. Yeah. So we dare not to do that. But we are now like discussing in the in the parliament that we can re re refer our like voting um res registration like maybe from this city to this city, but mm. not on the online way. Yeah. So mm. that's, that's one of the uh, alternative to fix that. But yeah, but but some of the 
politicians they they try to focus more or like uh, they are just the representative of the young people. Although they are kind of like 40 or 50 years old, but they say, yeah, I am, I can stand for the young people. Mm. Yeah. And so I think in Taiwan for uh, many different elections, they try to get used to like in these years, they try to get used to like listening to the young people more. And they, we have the saying of the first time voters. So for now, the first time voter is 20 or 21 or 22. But like all the professors or the media for if, uh, every election, they try to go for the first time voters mm -hmm. to ask for like, why are going, who, who are you going to vote for? Because mm -hmm. it's the leading opinion for them, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, who are going to vote and maybe you'll like do a very big campaign in the future and you can live like very very long and so you are like gradually going to change our politics so they'll try to see the trend mm -hmm. of the politics yeah. from the first time voters now yeah but yeah. i feel like it's even though you don't have any rights to be a candidate and also voting until 20 years old but you have many succeed policies that the current president yeah. has like I heard from mm -hmm. you that so the government needs to pay thirty percent of dormitory fees. Yeah, um, uh, for no. our like for college tuition, college tuition, tuition the, yeah. the government now because they promised last year be, be, before the election for the young people. So now our like uh, college student, uh, college private college uh, tuition, they are going to the government is going to pay half of them. So, yeah, and for like our rent, if you rent the house outside for the rental price, they are going to pay about 30% of them. Wow. So you don't have to be that like stressed if you go mm -hmm. to the capital for studying or for work. Mm -hmm. And for like many uh, young people, we care about like our uh, cultural rights or like our rights to access like sports or, or different things. So the government, they pay for the, the coupon. We have the apps in, in young people's cell phone. Mm. And that's learned from the U European countries that uh, the government will pay for some of the access for movies for young people or for when you buy the books oh. or when you go to a theater. Yeah. They are going to pay for some of them. Mm. And for if you go to the like sport activities, the government is going to pay for about uh, for for people from 16 years old to like college student mm -hmm. yeah and that's their promise before the election yeah you said it's about sixty thousand yen per year yeah about for, like for, for coupon, for coupon, coupon, coupon in japanese mm -hmm. dollars yeah. sixty thousand yen mm -hmm. worth like, of coupon like movies yeah wow. for for our like local movies local, so like, like it's cultural. only for taiwanese oh. movie yeah. yeah to help like local help. industry like, yes yeah. also that's, that's help good. the local yeah. industry and help the young people to get yeah. access to these different like local cultures mm. yeah it's, it's very that's cool. there's so yeah. many things that mm. i wish we had that in, in, in japan. japan yeah <laughs> and then and mental health break day yeah. 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 yeah and they can mm. have the three times constitution each year for people from 15 to 30. Mm. and want to like lower the age so i think uh, the government has promised that uh next year they are going to lower it to 12. Mm -hmm. so 12. for senior high yeah. and junior high yeah. of yeah. them they can go to the like uh the, the, their mental health mm -hmm. if they, they just they don't have to be sick mm -hmm. if they just want to ask for some help mm -hmm. yeah i i think i mean from what I gather, there has to be support from the older generation, really, to make things smoother. Of course, you know, young people themselves, they can make a lot of different differences, but I think there has to be somewhere at a point where the older generation or the more experienced people in politics, you know, they, they have to, you know, open some doors for you or they have to, you know, get out of your way and, you know, get out of the seat for you to have a chance. And, and I mean, I get, I, I got that impression from Frederick's stories, like, you know, when you, um, occupied your high school <laughs> and the teachers are like, okay, <laughs> we'll just play right. board games and eat cake for, 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 for the first time. And then yeah. maybe eventually they got a bit tired, but <laughs> I mean, but that's, 
that's really amazing that you know adults were willing to let the teenagers just have a go and just try it out, and maybe you won't, you know, succeed in everything first, but you know you can have an experience, and you know, we can maybe guide you or just you know let it, let you do your thing, and that's really um, I'm envious. <laughs> yeah, I think especially with the education. Uh, cuts. It was kind of easy to make that coalition of young people and and a few grown-ups because uh, it was the teachers' jobs in the line, so they mm -hmm. had a kind of natural solidarity mm -hmm. with us, even though we were the ones protesting. Mm -hmm. And then I think we were also. Um, it, it's not like we trained a lot for it, but I think we were kind of good at our narratives because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of politicians wanted to paint us as if we didn't care about our education since we mm. striked mm. and occupied uh, the buildings. But I think we, our message got through that no, actually we're doing this because we care so much about our education mm. and about our future and about our teacher. And I think you mentioned care for, for this world as well. And I think, I, I think more and more progressive movements all over the world are opening their eyes to what it means to build narratives around a, hopeful and positive messages because I think in yeah at least in Denmark I think for example the climate climate movement has been a little too focused on raising awareness about the consequences of climate change without really pushing so hard for demands that would actually fix some of those things mm -hmm. and in, in recent years that has changed a lot and I think that's why we're seeing the climate movement become so much bigger and stronger in Denmark also because of the climate crisis itself escalating, becoming more obvious to people. But, uh, but I think kind of moving on from just spreading awareness to actually spreading hope at, about real changes that can be made in, in everyday lives mm. of ordinary people. I think at least I think I'm, I'm very happy that the high school movement was where I kind of started mm. because I think that has influenced a lot of the ways I think about politics today. Uh, and, and building, yeah, that movement back with the high school occupations was not just about uh, stopping the cuts. We envisioned a kind of alternative school day and and what what a completely different high school could look like. Yeah. Do you ha do any of you have questions for each other? From <laughs> yeah, maybe Sophie. I just think that what you told before about starting with only four people and not that mm. much money and then growing into this extremely big movement was so inspiring because I think a lot of young people especially look at the world today and they think that in order to change that they need so many things they they, they aren't prepared and they mm. can't do it at all uh, but but I think that story goes to show that actually with very few people, at least in the beginning, of course you want to become more, but with very few people and a very little money, but a really good idea, you can actually change a whole lot. And mm. yeah, maybe just curious about like how that uh, transition looked for you guys, mm. starting from such a small team, how it grew until that mm. so large protest. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm really curious to Alvin to ask about the social media because it's for us social media was a big player yeah. in in allowing us to garner so much momentum. Um, we, yeah, we kind of put the call out really to say if you if you care about mm. the fact that the climate crisis currently has a hold on on our collective home, mm. and if we want to create a better future, these are the demands that will center our actions around. If you support these, get in touch and we'll find a place for you in this movement. And yeah. the amount of people who just came back and said, you know, I'm creative or, you know, I love to, I love to write or I love to organize. I'm a logistics person. I'm really into design. Like we just built this team of people who just complemented each other so, so, so well. And so social media was really big for us and the mainstream media did really help out too. Mm. And we developed some key relationships with people both in, in media, but also um, then connected with key politicians and key business owners. I really think um, in order to get the turnout that we had, the, actually getting support from businesses, which were, for me, like I presumed would be the most unlikely area to gain support from, especially for the kind of 
radical, mm. so to speak, radical demands that we were seeking to um, to achieve. But yeah, really to get the young people on board, I think it was just both kind of the hype around it saying like, this is going to be something that you won't want to miss. Yeah. Like this mm. is going to be you, if you join this team, like you'll not only find probably some of your best friends, which has very much been the case. Like I'm still best friends with all the young people that I organized alongside and, and continue to work with. And this is something that when you look back and you've got your your kids sitting next to you, your future kids, this is something that you'll be proud mm -hmm. that you were a part of. Because right now, this is a defining moment. As you said, there are so many threats to democracy, threats to systems that help us transport ourselves, threats to systems to access mm -hmm. our education. But if we stand up now, we can divert all of that to something that's way better. Yeah. And yeah, I think that really inspired a lot mm -hmm. of young people, that, that narrative around what's possible. And yeah, proliferating that through social media really helped. Um, I'm really keen to hear like your strategies for, I didn't realize you had such a large Instagram following through, yeah, through the work you've been doing in Taiwan. What were the steps that you took to, to build such a big, a big community of people? And how do you, how do you also sustain that level of, of community around the work you do? Yeah. Um, since we, we were established from us and we are volunteers mm -hmm. so from the very beginning we thought yeah we have the experience of uh social movement but we didn't like really share most of our ideas with the public pop, a politician or or with the the public because we just focus on our own movement so i think that's our problem in the past and mm -hmm. we started to like redo something on like facebook and instagram and we started to realize that nobody's going to teach us mm -hmm. <laughs> how to do that. Like like in schools, mm -hmm. in, in college, nobody's going to talk about this mm -hmm. and no no this kind of lessons to tell you like how do you like really do advocacy. So uh we tried to try on ourselves and from the mm -hmm. very beginning I think things are so messy because <laughs> yeah we try to post like things that we really care about or like in our own opinion but like nobody cares <laughs> and I say like who are you yeah I'm quite sure I like really follow your, your your like this kind of different discourses and um, I think we started to note that we still have to do the connection the network with the like real world. Mm. So we've been to like first, I think we've been to the different uh, schools in mm. Taiwan for the, uh, we try to know the school's uh, student association for them. And we have like different clubs, they focus on different issues and we try to know that. So we have this kind of uh, little like re reunion or different this kind of meeting with them in different cities and counties from the very beginning. And we started to build up one, like we cannot say that that's a very concrete uh, alliance, but this kind of network we call the student network with them. And like for each year, when they end up their own term, they are going to like uh, succeed, succeed that this to their their like next mm -hmm. president or next club. And they started to have this kind of uh, a network, and we post it on uh on instagram like what mm -hmm. we discuss and what's the issue that young people really care about like nowadays because we have this discussion so we make sure this is like young people really caring about mm -hmm. and after that we try to uh do the like supervising the government like whether they are going to do that or not so we started to know that for young people they don't really know like what's discussed in the government or in the in the council or in the parliament. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a problem. So we like look into the different survey or different policy, like mostly in the Ministry of Education because they focus more on the youth. So we try to first translate their policy because although they are like trying to write it in Mandarin, but like people cannot really read that <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's very difficult or mm -hmm. like just from the authority. So we try to let the student or the youth know that what rights do you have, like in the regulations, in the laws, in the in the policies, and we post that every day. So we try to that that just become one of just like the youth media mm -hmm. in the end. So we volunteer to do that, and we have like the different like 
one day you are responsible for that and one day the next day maybe you are responsible for that so every day they just like the for 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 our uh followers they are just like sub subscribing the media and we are going to like tweet you or if on instagram to tell you that okay what's today's information they hopefully uh, be one news and or there can be one like piece of information that you can try to do that in the school but not only like you can like challenge that but that's your rights because that's written in what kind of regulation so they can like really utilize this kind of uh, uh, information mm -hmm. in school just like do you, you do you want to wear your uniform or you think you want mm -hmm. to try the alternative mm -hmm. if you want to try and this is the road that you can get into the committee in school and you can have the, this discussion and if you don't know like what proposal you can really like provide in the committee mm -hmm. you can try to do this mm -hmm. yeah and that's like kind of the package mm -hmm. or like uh, if you go to the school late and you are like kind of punished by the by the teachers uh, yeah you didn't obey the the, the, the the role yeah but maybe you can do this like in the in the school you can like not just like suing but you can do your your rights uh, discussion in the schools we have the school uh, school student rights committee in every in, in every campus so they can try and the students are like before that I don't really know that so mm -hmm. so yeah now I know and I'm going to like really try try to use it use that information yeah but I think for our our because for our campus our student they can vote for the like student president mm -hmm. but they cannot vote for any candidate right, in a society so yeah for us yeah we try to um, they, they try to do the alternative, they cannot vote, but they can do something in their community, in the campus. So they'll like be more focused because when they focus on different candidates, that's no use for them. So they focus more on this fan page that the fan page really tell us what to do and how to do that. And, and maybe the, the different news, like we try to get higher smoking age in Taiwan last year. So for many like 18 year old smoker, they are not told by the government that you cannot smoke anymore, but from our fan page. And they are kind of uh, complaining on our fan page, but we say yeah, like, yeah, you can, you can, if you don't like, uh, you are not uh, willing to do that or you, you are complaining, you can tell the government or like when you are a citizen, you can vote. Like, mm -hmm. although I am not like that uh, on your side, but yes this is for democracy mm -hmm. so you have to do more and you have to like try to uh, pursue your own right mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow i wish we had uh three more hours to do yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. this is um i mean this has been a really uh, amazing time you know just i mean there, there's there's heaps and heaps more that i wish we could all share but Unfortunately, time is limited and there is a lot of translation to do <laughs> after yeah. this. Yeah, but um, yeah, just just thank you so much. I mean, I wish I could say more than just thank you so much, but honestly, it's um, I, I think, yeah, like Momoko said, you know, it's a really special opportunity for people in Japan um, to get this opportunity to just like listen on people from other, around the world talking about like political social issues and not not just like you know like the hard stuff like you know like the boring stuff but also just like you know fun and in inspiring stories of teenage antics and um, just yeah like having a hopeful future which I'm sure you all will when you go back home very soon but Momoko do you want to have something to say, last words last for them. Words from them. But thank you for today. And do, do we have time? Not time. I, I, get, I uh, think, I maybe think. Maybe I should just stop. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because we want to ah, have a little yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. 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 So yeah, just thank you. Thank you. And yeah, but I feel like many difficulties in Japan for, for young, as young people who want to have like social 
justice, climate justice, because um, actually it's difficult to say that uh, this is youth opinion, because I know much young people uh, don't have enough space to talk about politics and also their they need to survive their lives mm -hmm. by themselves. So, mm, yeah, I thought like your story is so inspiring and it was nice to hear. Mm. Mm. I hope you all enjoy, you will, enjoy or will enjoy or have enjoyed your time mm. in Japan, yes. despite the heat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to Frederick, Sophie and Alvin. Thank you so much. はい、えー、ということで、多分、ポリタス TV 史上最長英語時間だったんじゃないかと思うんですけれど、はい、皆さんいかがでしたでしょうかいや、本当にね、ちょっといろいろ、もりもりだくさんだったなぁと、うん、あの、よ、よくも悪くも<笑>、ね、悪くもっていうのはちょっとこれ、この後の編集が怖いからなんですけれど。<笑>いや、それは本当によろしくお願いしますって感じですけど、でも、よろしくお願い,いや、なんか、いや、たまたま、はい、この、いや、そうなのよ。<笑>東京に私の友達が3人もいるっていう。そうなの。すごい。この機会を無駄にするわけにはいかないと。ね、たまたまなんですよね、皆さん。そう、えっと、ソフィー、あの、は、まあ、その地方芸人ニュージーランドやってて、今2ヶ月日本にインターン来てても残り5日って言ってたんですけど。地方議会委員がインターンで外国に行くってそもそもどういうことってそう、なんかね、でもそれは結構ありえ、なんか普段はないことらしくて、うん、でもあの、うまく仕事を調整して、まあ、理解してくれたし、まあ、その、日本でこうやってやって、あの、インターンやったりとかメディアに出ることが、まあ、最終的にはニュージーランドのためになるであろうっていうことで、うん、あの、市民の理解を得られたって言ってました。しかも全然あの、政治とか関係ないというか、あの、ベジタリアンフード推進的な経理団体みたいなところでインターンされてたっていう聞きましたけど。そう、そう,そうなんですよねそうそうそう。でもだからそうそう、そういう意味では、すごいラッキーで、たまたま友達の友達で、うん、で、あの、日本に来た時にで何回かあって、それこそ、あの、ニュース通信に一回インタビュー、ねうん、うん。で、トラウデナオミちゃんに、あの、インタビューされてましたね。紹介していこうっていうのもできたし、うん、イベントに私たちのイベントにも出てもらってっていうのがあって、はい、で、あと、そのアルビンは、本当に、うん、あの、私が台湾に行った時に会ったことあったんですけど、はい、なんか先週ね、たまたまこの企画も決まってた後になんかね、うん、そのテキストで、来週日本行くんだけど会えるみたいな感じで来て、<笑>え、みたいな、この日、で、ちょうど今日の午前、あの今、収録が2時くらいでから始めた、1時か、から始めたんですけど、はい、ちょうど、この日の午前中に、普通に会う約束をしてて、したんですよ。で、そしたら、あれみたいな。ここ午後行けるんじゃないこのまま。で、なんか予定あるってないって言うから、じゃあちょっと来て、みたいな。で、フレデリックさんは、あの、フレデリックはずっと、私たち、ノイスのジャパンが1ヶ月日本に、あの、呼んで、いろいろ、学校で講演したりとか、まあ、いろいろしてるっていうような感じで、今来て、10日間くらいですかね。うんでも、なんか、そう、時間がちょっと足りなかったですね。まあでも、何時間あっても足りないけど。<笑>まあ何時間あっても足りないし、うん、私としても、まあ正直なんていうか、最初はそのフレデリックさんが、あの、まあちょっと講演をするっていう時にちょっと通訳として。うん、そう、通訳として。そう。で、あの、まあお会いして、で、もうすごく、あの、ね、まあ今日、今日もありましたけど、あの、本当にトーク面白いし、まあデンマー、なかなかデンマークの政治の話とか、こんなに、あの、細かく聞ける機会ないなぁなんて、考えて、ちょっとね、三人でこう休憩してお茶してたら、うん、なんか、あれこれってちょっともう少しポリトスでできるんじゃねって思って。<笑>あれなんかソフィー、ソフィーもね、一ヶ月ぐらい前に、うん、あの、そう、一緒に夕飯食べました、ね。そうそう、たまたまね、うん、私が、あの、TBS ラジオで、あの、毎週木曜日やってる時に、時に、あの、ももちゃんも TBS ラジオにいて、で、あ、この後は、あの、ニュージランドから来てる、あの、あの地方議会,議会の議員のことご飯するんですけど、いや、行くしって。いや、行くし終わったら来てくださいとか。行くしかないでしょ、それはって。<笑>いや、でも本当になんか今回は、その、うん、まあね、あの国地域それぞれ事情が違いますけれど、うん、やっぱりその、まあ若者の意欲、あの、もちろんね、彼らのようなあの若者ばかりじゃないっていうのは当然だけれど、うん、その、自分たちで変えられるものがあるんだっていう、その、なんていうのかな、こう自己肯定感とかじゃなくて、もっとその、自己効力感っていうのかしら、うんうん、その自分の、自分のそうエフィカシー、自分の、あの、影響力を信じるとか、うん、こういうことをすれば、きっと何かが変わるはずだっていう、うん、その信じる力ってものすごい重要だなって感じました。ね、でもなんか願わくば、この今回聞いてもらった話が、ただ3人がすごいっていう話ではなく、<笑>
、それぞれの国でやっぱりその声をちゃんと聞くっていう土壌だったりとかシステムだったりとか、あの機会っていうのがあるからこそ、こういうムーブメントが起きて、社会に変化が起きてるっていう。うん、なんでその日本社会もなんかこう、もちろん若い世代がこういう人たちに影響を受けて、あのいろいろ意欲的にもっと活動する人が増えていくっていうのも大事だと思うけど、同時にやっぱり、なんかその、それだけの問題ではないっていうか、なんかそこにね、フォーカスが、あの、当たるといいなといつも会うたびに思うんですよ。そうよね。うん、なんか、デンマークいいな、ニュージーランドいいなとかじゃなくてね。ねそ,うそうで、台湾もね、台湾アジアで初めて同性婚できてとか。そう、ね、そう。しかもね、あの、国民投票めっちゃやるって面白いよね。面白い。いや、だってそれが疲れるっていうのも面白いですよね。うん、ね原発のことから、国名オリンピックでなんて呼ぶから、同性婚どうするとか、そういうのを、まあ、国民投票で意見を求められるっていうのも、日本って国民投票ってほぼ全然やんないもんね。うん、まあ結構やるのも大変っていうのもありますし、そもそもまあ住民投票自体もそんなに、なんかこう、まあやってる地域もありますけど、うん、まあなかなか、うん、って感じですしね。なかなか、うんって感じですよね。でもなんかその、どの国、<笑>まあやっぱりそれぞれ、まあ今日は結構ね、みんな自分の活動の紹介って感じだったけど、はい、なんか結構私はみんな、あの、それぞれと話してるときに、やっぱどういうふうに、まあ、こう少子高齢化で、やっぱりどの世代も、あのどの国でも、まあちょっと台湾だけは違うかもしれないけど、まあ、特にデンマークとかと話の話とかをいつもここしてると、なんかその、やっぱ学生運動の時の世代っていうのが、うん、まあ大きな力を持って、まあその、特に、あの、プログレッシブの方、あの、こう形成しましたと。で、だけども、その人たちの、まあ、その年代っていうのは、まあ、60代、70代、80代になってきていて、やっぱりもうちょっと、選挙のたびに、あの、政党のリストっていうか、その、ゆ、なんていうのこう、自分たちの支持者リストみたいなのが、うんうん、その、死亡によって減っていく感じその、なんかこの政党支持しなくなるではなくて、あの、な、人が亡くなってしまうから、あの、それで減ってしまうっていうのに、まあ、その、直面していて、だからこそ、生徒を若返らせてなきゃいけないっていうのが、うんまあ、すごくあって、まあ、だからフレデリックさんがやってる、その、あのことっていうのも、まあ、一つそういうことを、その、生徒の若者の団体を作っ、あの、若い世代のだけで運営する、まあ、生徒セネムっていうのがあるんですけど、それを作って、うんうん、その、よくリインベント、だからなんか再発明みたいな、再開発、うんはいはい、再発明するみたいなのをやってて、うんうん、まあ、そこら辺とかもっと学べることがあるかなというふうに、えー、思います。そうですよね。まあもちろんその反対勢力というか、うん、まあその、まあ嘲笑勢力、冷笑勢力なんでもいいですけれど、<笑>もちろんそういうのもあるし、うん、でも、まあだからなんだっていうか、まあそういう、なんか言わ、言ったやつには言わせておけって、跳ね返せるぐらいの強さがどこかにあるんだろうなとはちょっと思った。ね、そ,うそう、あとやっぱ、なんかやっぱ、バッカンフォースみたいな、なんかその、行ったり来たり、うんうん、全部。だからその、ずっとうまくいってるっていうよりは、まあこう、それぞれどの国も、こう、政権交代だったりとか、はい、いろんな、こう、バックラッシュの中でこう、いろいろ動いてる。中で、ね、そう、いいあの、ね、そう、やってて、まあそういう意味では、まあ日本もそういう部分あるとは思うんですけど、うん、なんか、なんていう前にずっと進んでるわけじゃなくて。そうそうでも、守らなきゃいけない時は守るし、みたいな。そこら辺のね、運動のダイナミックスは面白いなっていうふうに思いますね。ねあと、台湾の場合はちょっとわからないんですけど、うん、その、まあ、デンマークとかニュージーランドは、うん、その、なんか、レールに敷かれてるっていう感覚が日本よりずっと薄いと思うんですよ。うん、まあ、そのギャップイヤーの話もね、うん、あの、また別のところでフレデリックに聞いたんですけど、うん、だからその中学、高校、大学、え、それでなんか、あの、就職っていうどこかのタイミングで、まあ、1年とか2年とか3年、ちょっと、まあ、なんかレールからその降りて、まあ、なんか旅をするなり、あの、は、仕事をするなり、うん、もしくは、あの、ももちゃんも言ってた、あの、フォルケホイスコーレみたいな、その市民の学校っていうところで、こう、なんかいろんなライフスキルを学んだり、その自分の人生これからどういうふうに進めていきたいかなって、ゆっくり考える時間を設けて、で、なんかある程度何かしら方向性決めたら、うん、じゃあ、また学校に戻ろう。もしくは、じゃあ就職してみようっていう。なんかそういうところで、なんかこう、つ、次、次へと次へと進まないと、もう取り残されてしまう、落ちこぼれになってしまうっていう恐怖が、多分日本とはかなり違うと思うんですよね。うそういうところで、なんか、あれなんか社会って、あれなんか政治ってっていうことを自分ごととして、より深く考える機会があるのかな、なんて。ね、それは本当にそう思いますね。そう,そういうちょっとね、うん、あの、制度の話で比べちゃうと、じゃあ日本はしょうがないねってなっちゃうから、そういうのも良くないんだけど。うん。うんうん、そうそう
。まあね、でも本当なんかどの国もうまくいってる国はないっていうか。そうそうそう。ね、<笑>なんかそれはね、すごいいつも思うんですよね。だからね、こう失敗の話を聞かせてくれたのもすごい良かったな、うんうんうん。失敗っていうか、その、まあうまくいかなかったこと、うんうんうん、すごい成功ではなかったけど、でもあの時の、うん、あのー、挑戦があったから、次に進めたっていう話はね、三、うん、人ともしてくれたし。そう,、ねうん、そういうところは、忘れないでおきたいなと、うんうん。いや、でも、本当、ちょっとね、今日時間なかったんで、もし可能であれば、ちょっと、あと、津田さんに聞こうと思うんですけど。なんか、あの、だから、ちょっと、もし、これがうまくいかなかったら、もう、ここはカットっていうことで、あれなんですけど。はい、<笑>いや、なんか、あの、フレリックさんが、その、所属してる、赤力連合っていう政党は。うん、その、昔、なんか、もっと小さい政党が三つあって、でも、どの政党も、国政政党で。いられなくなった時に、なんかこう連合みたいな形でできた政党で、で、昔は本当にこう、古い、まあ左翼みたいな政党だったんだけど、あの、今はまあ割とコペンハーゲンで 25% 得票してて、あの、全体の。で、若い人たちに支持されてて、えっと、2010年代には、あの、2008、9年だったかなちょっとそのあたり、2011年かなくらいの時に、23歳の子が、当初になって、はい、で、国会議員で、すごい、首相の次に得票して、みたいな。うんうん、で、まあ、結構その、大きく、なんか飛躍したきっかけを作ったみたいな。で、やっぱりその、なんだろうな、こう、政党をどう若返らせるのかとか、やっぱり、なんかいい原則とか考え方はあるんだけれども、やっぱりかなりオールドファッションになってきている。うん、まあ、今回都知事選見てもそうだと思うんですよね、やっぱり。って言った時に、なんかもっと学べることあるなっていうふうに、ちょっとここ今日ね、あんまり聞けなかったんで、もし、可能であれば。これはこれでやりたい。第二弾。第二弾。ね、<笑>そうですね。ぜひぜひ。そう。そう。もうちゃんやってください。え、一緒にやってください。<笑>一緒にやりましょう<笑>、はい。はい。はい。そんな感じで皆さん、はい、今日はね、あの、最後までお付き合いできて、本当にありがとうございました。あの、皆さんの感想などね、うん、いろいろ、え、チャット欄でもコメントでも、もしくは X などでのね、えー、ポスト、シェア、えー、していただければ励みになります。えー、そしてね、あのー、まあ、私の方での字幕翻訳が、えー、順調にいけばなんですけれど、この放送、配信、は、えー、7月30日配信予定なんです、うん、ということは,こ,とは、えー、この次の週末ですね8月3日4日、えー、ロンダンフェスインイズ、えー、こちらもう本当にもうもう見ればわかるんですけどもとにかくすごい人たちがいっぱい集まります。私もいます。はい。うん、えー、で、えー、私、まあ、MC などをね、こうさせていただく予定なんですけれど、あのー、社会学者の、えー、社会経済学者のえー、斉藤浩平さんと一緒に、はい、あの、登壇できるということらしいので、えー、めちゃくちゃ楽しみで、えー、緊張していますが、はい、皆さん、もしよければ、ぜひ、このロンダンフェスインイズ、えー、リンクをチェックして、えー、今からでもまだ,まだ間に合いますので、えー、ご参加してください。いつで会いましょう。はい、焚き火でマシュマロ焼きましょう。はい、<笑>そんな感じです。はい。どうもありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。